Bargello quilts, traditionally made with 8 to 20 strips of fabric, are cut into segments and then they're reassembled, are characterized by wave or motion design. My guest used her analytical mind to add a twist to the Bargello method, adding unlimited design options. I'd like you to welcome Maggie Ball, who is a quilting enthusiast, who's here to share her alternative method to Bargello quilting. Maggie, you've taken this traditional quilting to a new level. Yes, Nancy, I've used the Bargello principles to create a Bargello block and it only has 16 pieces and it's very easy to piece and there are many possibilities for the design options with this block. Let's begin with a project created from 12 identical blocks with sashing strips. At first glance, this table runner appears complex, but actually the blocks are easy to piece from four sets of four strips. Bargello quilts with a twist. That's what's coming up next on Sewing with Nancy. Sewing with Nancy, TV's longest airing sewing and quilting program with Nancy Zeman is made possible by Baby Lock, a complete line of sewing, quilting, and embroidery machines and sergers. Baby Lock, for the love of sewing. Madeira, specializing in embroidery, quilting, and special effect threads because creativity is never black and white. Koala Studios, fine sewing furniture custom built in America. Clover, makers of sewing, knitting, quilting, and embroidery products for over 25 years. Experience the Clover difference. And amazing designs and Class A needles. Earlier, I gave a definition of traditional Bargello quilting. And Maggie, this quilt made by my coworker Gretchen Udak shows colors from the 90s and the traditional motion and wave of a Bargello. Yes, typically in a Bargello quilt, um, 8 to 20 strips are sewn together. In this case, we have 10 different strips. And you can see that where the countercuts are made wide, you have a shallow curve forming. And where they're cut skinny, you get a steep slope. So you get a really nice mountain and valley effect with the colors just moving through the quilt. It's beautiful. And this type of quilt was the inspiration to, for you to make a block. But before we show your blocks, let me just give a brief description of how this technique works together. The sample shows around 11 strips sewn together. And then ends would be sewn into a circle and cut into a circle. And then you'd release a seam. And you can see different widths cut and different staggering of color. Yes, yeah, so we've got uh, this beautiful movement of the orange coming through here, making the mountain. And, you know, many quilters are intimidated by this technique because you sew so many strips together and you do mm -hmm. have to keep those seams parallel. And the technique that I've devised, you only sew four strips at a time and we're making a 16-piece block. Now, this is the one of the projects that we'll be working with today. And we're going to show you that the 16 blocks are all identical. So here you can see one of the blocks. Uh, and there's basically a large triangle in one corner. Sorry, a large square in one corner. And we go down to a small square. And then the uh, grid is filled in with rectangles. And these blocks are twisted. So you can see here mm -hmm. the large square is down in this corner. And we can make a, uh, a beautiful design um, with this tessellated butterfly form. Um, you can see how this arc of color mm -hmm. goes through. And when the blocks are put adjacent, um, you get a secondary pattern that develops over the whole quilt. So you get these tessellated butterflies. And later in the program, we'll be using 16 blocks to show you just a few of the options. But this is another option with the same block style. And it's easier to see the blocks here because we have sashing strips in between the blocks. And you can see that where these four large squares come together, if we didn't have the sashing strips, you'd have one big mm -hmm. square of fabric. So the sashing strips kind of split that up and uh, um, make it very attractive looking. The block itself that we're going to be working with in this program is designed with a big print of a fabric and some other complementary colors. And this is the design we'll be working with, or the, the color palette. And I like the way, Maggie, that you choose color. 
Yes, um, quilters often find this challenging, but if you pick a theme fabric that has is multicolored, mm -hmm. you can then pull all the other colors from it. And it's important to have a good range of values so that the, the patterns are gonna show up. So from this fabric, we can pull out the magenta, the purple, the black, and the yellow, and there's even this green color mm -hmm. in the feathers. So all these colors are in the start fabric, and that's a great way for people to begin if they feel intimidated about choosing colors. And you need to have the lights as well as the darks for the contrast for the pattern to show. Yes, if you have fabrics that are all the same value, mm -hmm. it's not going to work. No, not in the least. And one of the ways to make it work are, is to make a little design or a diagram. And in the book that accompanies today's program, you'll find this printout. And Maggie, you've done some s colorations. Yeah, so this uh, diagram actually shows this particular block that we're working with today. And um, when I teach this class, I have my mm -hmm. students, first of all, annotate this diagram so that they can work out how to place the fabrics in the block. Um, and everything is a mirror image around this diagonal. So we have the diagonal line of large square going down to small square, and then the fabric placement is a mirror image on either side of that diagonal. In this particular block, we've got arcs of color. Mm -hmm. I'll um, just lay this on top. Right. And uh, so that when we put these blocks together, this, this in particular, this arc is going to pop out. Um, and the way that we do, the way that we uh, piece the block, we have four sets of four strips. So once you've got this diagram made, the next thing you're going to do is, is come up with a cutting chart mm -hmm. so that sure. for each separate fabric, you can cut the pieces. And so you, oh, you're going to transfer the information from the diagram to the cutting chart. Um, and yeah. then as you cut the fabric, you, you put mm -hmm. them down in the correct sets. So our block. Oh, I, excuse me. I have them <laughs> shifting, but you can organize them accordingly. So the block is basically made from four sets of four strips, mm -hmm. an A set, B set, C set, D set. And the diagram is annotated. So it has all these letters on. It also has the cutting sizes on it. And as you cut the fabric, you lay it down on the correct piece of paper, and then that way all your strips are organized before you start piecing. Speaking of piecing, that's what we're going to do right now. Before sewing the strip sets together, just a quick review of machine setup. Straight stitch, and then we'll be working with an all-purpose thread. You might want to use a quilting needle, which I prefer to use, and then a patchwork foot that's a fourth of an inch wide along one side because, Maggie, you work with the traditional fourth of an inch seam allowances. Yes, and it's important to be consistent on those. Now, you saw at our table that we had four sets, four strip sets cut according to our little pattern guide. And we're going to first demonstrate the strip set of A. And I have small little pieces from the A set. You'll have long crosswise cuts. And you have A1, A2, A3, and A4 piece. And to place them together, we're going to place two on top of one and four on top of three. And Maggie's going to do the stitching for you. It's important to be all, always consistent with this. So you're going to take the largest piece, which is the A1 piece, and place on top of it the A2 piece. And I like to start always with a little strip of fabric folded in half that's in my machine. And that way I can sew from end to end, which when you're sewing mm -hmm. patchwork pieces is particularly important. So we're just going to stitch with our quarter inch seam allowance along here. So the, the A2 piece goes on top of the A1. So it's always the largest strip on the bottom. When we get to the end, I can just put my little strip back in here and then I'm ready to go the next time I start sewing. And now Nancy's going to show you how to press this. Two-step pressing, just like we've done in almost all sewing and quilting ideas. And first to set the seam, press it flat. And then press it open. Now, Maggie, we're pressing the seam open, not to one side in this quilting technique. 
Yes, usually you sew, uh, you, you press to one side when you're quilting, but in this particular case, we can't predict ahead of time the exact configuration of the blocks. And so um, usually you would, you would have seams going one way and then an adjacent piece of seams going out the other way so that they butt. But because we don't know how we're going to arrange the mm -hmm. blocks, we are um, opening all those seams and that way when the blocks are joined together, and the segments are joined, uh, you don't get bulky seams. And the key to pressing open such a narrow seam allowance is doing the angle tugging or positioning of the fabric. The tip of the iron then catches the seam open and you don't end up with a little pleat or tuck on the, under, on the correct side. Yes, it's much easier than having mm -hmm. it down flat on the ironing board. And then after you've opened that out, you can turn it over and press from the right side as well. Now there will be four strip sets that will be sewn together, the A, B, and C, and D. And you might guess we have them already sewn together. Here is the f section. We have one, two, and three, four of A sewn together. And then, Maggie, that's cut into a segment. Yes, you're going to counter cut those strip sets and the, uh, the A segments will be three and a half inches wide. And here's the B. Which is two and a half inches wide. And C is one and three quarter inches. We'll flip this around and then the last one is the D and that is one and a quarter inches. And I have these four segments cut and then Maggie's going to show how they're being sewn together. Now when we sew these together, we do exactly the same thing. We put the larger piece on the bottom. So the A1 segment will go on the bottom and the B segment goes on the top and you sew from the ones down to the fours. So the ones are the widest strips and the fours are the narrowest. And if you always do this, then you're uh, little segments will come out the right way round. And I like to pin at these intersections and that way they're really sharp. Um, if you put the pins in perpendicular and you're going to line up these two open seams and stick your pin in perpendicular to the seam lines. And I'm using little skinny quilting mm -hmm. pins um, and I can then stitch Again, we have this little strip in here so I can stitch from end to end. And I have my B segment on top of the A segment. So I'm just going to stitch this together. And then I have one mm -hmm. already pinned where the D section goes on top of the C segment. Again, you're stitching from the wi widest strip down to the narrowest and you always stitch in that order. And we sew the, the strips together in pairs, just like we did the strips, we're sewing these segments in pairs. And we're going to press the seams open and then sew the pairs together. It's much easier to do this this way instead of sewing them all together and then trying to open up all those seams at once. And, and Maggie has sewn all the both pairs together to create the block. This is the finished one. And then pressing it open. Again, we're opening the seam. If you use a seam roll, it'll be much easier to open the seam. You'll be creating 16 of these blocks, and then we'll show you how to lay out the blocks into interesting Bargello with a twist designs. Maggie demonstrated how to create one of these blocks, but you'll be creating 16 or more of them. And we have 16 blocks and now the options for layout. And there are so many options. And we're just going to demonstrate to you mm -hmm. how easy it is to just turn a couple of blocks and how different the images are. And I think you'll be amazed. So in the center here of our 16, we've got eight down the bottom here and we're just building out. Uh, we've got these small D4 squares coming together. So it's almost like a nine patch in the middle and you can see how these large squares come together mm -hmm. to create a bigger area. So if we start off this way, we have four large squares on this. Correct. And now we're going to turn around the ones in the center and you can see how different it's going to look. Hmm. It's a kaleidoscope of images, only a square this time, but beautiful. And then we can go further so we can just turn around the corners. So let's turn the corners around the other way and you can see how that looks. 
it's amazing. Now to, with that tessellating look with, the, with movement is achieved by another twist. Yes, we're just going to turn around two of the center blocks here. And look what we have now. Mm -hmm. You can just see because of the light and dark of fabric combination, the little butterfly effect and the movement. Yeah, it's really astounding all the different combinations you can come up with and so much fun to play with it. And quilters love to have yes. a new building block, but then they can get creative with this and turn it around and make their own designs. And here's a image of Maggie's Taste of Autumn quilt. And the additional component to this quilt is the sashing. That's right. And what you can do is uh, instead of having sashing strips that are all the same color, you can put a variety of colors of sashing strips and cornerstones into the quilt. And so you can actually continue these lines on through the design. Um, and so your, uh, that comes an integral part of the design, um, which mm -hmm. is exciting and it, it just gives more possibilities. Now we'll add some sashing strips to this design and Maggie has some pre-cut colors. Notice that she ha you'll be putting in some black, some a chartreuse color or like a lime green and some cornerstones, small cuts of cornerstones in a variety of colors. Why don't you do some of your magic, Maggie? Right, we can just separate these out a little bit so we can put the sashing strips in and we're gonna have some overlapping here, but you'll get a rough idea um, of the kind of thing we can do. Yeah, so if we put these chartreuse strips in and then we can just... Uh, and I'll put a cornerstone in the middle. How about that? Just for some design. Let's put one of these in, the feathers in there. Okay. And then yep. we can put the yellow out here so it continues this yellow line Much through. Much better design. Um, and then we can maybe have some of these black sashing strips in the outer area. Great, I'll handle that. And so you can see how the design is gonna change just with playing around mm -hmm. with the sashing strips. So that is another design element and um, all adds to the Oh, let's see. We were going to put black in there, Okay. We? We'll put the black Great. along here. We'll put the chartreuse there in there. There we go. So we're just laying these out, playing with color, playing with design. How about a feather okay. here? Or would you prefer the yellow? Uh, we can just play and do whatever you okay. like. Well, a feather it is for right now, <laughs> feather design. So as we work on this, you can see the options. In the book that accompanies today's program, you'll find many more options for layouts, but this just gives you a concept of making these four subsets, four strip sets, cutting them into sections, putting them back together again, and we have many options of working with a quilt. The next step to lay the, or sew the sections together, and you'll have a Bargello quilt with a twist. Now to show you a showcase of some of Maggie's quilts, you can see additional layouts. And this is a charming roses design. Yes, the three that we're gonna show you all have 16 blocks, mm -hmm. just as we demonstrated. And here you can see where the block is. And this one has a diagonal line of these roses. And then, of course, as in all the other blocks, um, all the fabrics are laid out so that they're mirror image on either side of that diagonal. And that's what makes this design work. Yes, it's very important. Then underneath, a totally different combination of fabric colorations. But again, we have this diagonal line, but in this particular case, we've got this uh, very interesting colorful mm -hmm. print here, and then the, the blue fabrics going out to the diagonal. You can see the mirror image of the orange and black and lime on either side. A wonderful combination of fabric, Maggie, to make this design really pop. And behind us, Traditional colorations, yellow and blue, comfortable country looking Victorian, and again the block placement will put the window in that area. So here you can see the block, and uh, we've got four of these big blocks coming together in the center, so you have a big square here. And as we move out, you can see the block, and if you look in the corners, we've actually got partial blocks in the corners. Very interesting to see. Well, Thank you for the showcase, and next time on the sewing segments, we'll have more of Bargello quilts with a twist.
During this segment of Nancy's Corner, my guest explains being creative is an escape. She escapes to her studio to be creative with homemade paper, spun yarns, beads, and embroidery while combining color, texture, as well as contrast. I'd like to introduce you to Deb Menz, who is an author and artist and works with beautiful pieces or creates beautiful pieces. Welcome to Sewing with Nancy. Well, thank you for inviting me. When I saw your work on your website, I was an Pressed not only by the intricacies that you have, but the size. You work in small pieces and combine lots of texture. Um, I have to keep me, the pieces small because my ideas are detailed. So uh, if I work mm -hmm. very large, it would lose the intimacy. And intricate they are, <laughs> personal they are. Here are your nine mediums that you work with. That's correct. I work in hand spun yarn, I work with hand knitting, um, hand weaving hand embroidery, and that's using silk threads, bead embroidery that I use more than just seed beads, um, surface design that I'm printing on mm -hmm. the surface of fabric, handmade paper, pieced fabrics, and machine embroidery. What a combination. I couldn't choose one, so I had to use them all. <laughs> <laughs> and I think many of us who sew and quilt find that and hand work, we, we don't know where to stop, and you certainly merge them well together. Um, they complement each other and I can get different effects with different materials and, and so by using them all together I, I can come up with unique effects. Now this piece that's between us has paper and you've made the paper. Yes, I, I make paper, not the kind that you make in books, but um, kind that I use as art paper. So it's my background mm -hmm. pieces. And that would be handmade paper that, that I work with the surfaces and I've cut out thicker paper and, and again worked with the surface of the paper to be dimensional. S really it's smashing. <laughs> I don't, I guess I'm lost oh, for words. Thank it's, you. It, it's very stunning. Um, it was a field of flowers that I saw on a trip that I was at mm -hmm. and this is hand embroidered with silk threads um, and I do all the dyeing myself because I can't find enough color. Well of course you would. <laughs> <laughs> Can't say that I could do that, but yeah. wow, what a lovely combination. And you do get a lot of your inspiration from just taking snapshots, digital snapshots. That's correct. Mm -hmm. I'm not a really good um, artist as far as drawing goes, but I can record my ideas on um, mm -hmm. in a photograph, and I can take it from there and interpret. And then you have not only the embroidery, but the paper, um, dimensional I, paper. I use the paper as a frame in this piece, that, that it accentuates um, the actual embroidery that is a columbine mm -hmm. flower with the background. And again, it's hand-dyed hand silk, and the middle portion where the columbine is, is all hand beadwork because I wanted mm -hmm. it to be central in the design it, and show off. It, it does, it <laughs> certainly does. And some of your inspirations are collages. That's correct, that's correct. I like to work, my daughter is also a photographer, uh -huh. and, and I like working with you know magazines and cutting things out, Look garden magazines. Yes. So that is a collage that I created for a, a beadwork piece that I thought might take a couple weeks, but in reality, took about three months to finish. <laughs> and you told me, not just an hour or so a day. No, about eight hours a day for about three months. And then you listen to books on tape. Yes, that's that I can get into a very meditative mm -hmm. state. I have my design underneath, and I would work oh, about a square inch a day and, and get the colors right. And I had purchased about 600 colors of beads to, to make this piece work. It's, it, it's, really, <laughs> it's really phenomenal to see this up close and all the colors and the shapes and great job. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to look at another inspiration that Deb has. She has a work in process. Any of you have works in progress or process at home? I, I think we all do. And this is the kind of an abstract photo. It's, it's a photo of a reflection um, in the sun in water in a uh -huh. creek that I was at in Lake Tahoe. And, and this will be the interpretation that I've done. And this would be a palette of colors that I would oh. work with for one embroidery. So you have lots of colors to choose from. Yes, yes. So I, I'd rather have more to choose from than not. So when I start stitching, if it doesn't work out, I can take out and try another color. And then as we look at the back of this, you've used some silk and then backed it with fusible interfacing. And, That's correct, and just to keep it stable. And thumbtacked it to a frame in mm -hmm. lieu of working with an embroidery hoop. That's correct. I, I can mm -hmm. use any kind of canvas stretcher and um, make the size frame to fit the piece. 
Mm -hmm. Charming. And it'll be stretched after it's done. So. Well, thank you for being on Sewing with Nancy. And if our viewers would like to learn more about Deb Menz's work, you can go to sewingwithnancy.com, click under Nancy's Corner, and under the 2400 series, you'll find information and be able to link to her site. We'll be back next time with more information on Bargello quilts with a twist with our guest Maggie Ball. Until then, I hope you enjoy sewing, quilting, and embroidering. Thanks for joining us. Bye for now. Maggie Ball has written a fully illustrated book entitled Bargello Quilts with a Twist that serves as the reference for this two-part series. It's $18.99 plus shipping and handling. To order the book, call 800-336-8373 or visit our website at sewingwithnancy.com slash 2413. Order item number Z1629 Bargello Quilts with a Twist. Credit card orders only. To pay by check or money order, call the number on the screen for details. Visit Nancy's website at SewingWithNancy.com for more information on this program. Sewing with Nancy, TV's longest airing sewing and quilting program with Nancy Zeman has been brought to you by Baby Lock, Madeira Threads, Koala Studios, Clover, Amazing Designs, and Class A Needles. Closed captioning funding provided by Rowenta. with Nancy is a co-production of Nancy Zeman Productions and Wisconsin Public Television.